the main idea is that uh, our front end uh, that will uh, cooperate with Suit will generate some uh, input files that are basically PSVs. They are separated by tabs. And then there is a, a logic file where those uh, files are imported into the database via um, uh, something that's called file predicates. They are like your ordinary predicates, but they represent each entry in this file predicates represent a, a, a line that you read from your file. So that's the uh, the main way so you can take data from a file and in import it that uh, data into your database. But of course we don't need uh, the whole line in one predicate. We want to break it up into uh, more predicates that we are going to use later. So the, the main steps are you read lines from, a, from each file into a file predicate and then from each file predicate you break the data into different uh, input uh, predicates. So to give you an example, I run the analysis. If I go and look under facts, say sign cast. Okay. If you look here, that's one line. If I can select it, that's one line from the file, the first line. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, six, if I'm not mistaken, six fields. But if you look at the assigned cast relationship, relation, it doesn't have six, six columns. So what happens is that dupe has, so we go under logic, facts, and the first thing that you want to, to look is import. You search here for assign cast. So here we find the declaration <laughs> of an, uh, the file predicate assign cast. Uh, it has six fields as well. So each field, uh, each column here in the predicate corresponds to each field that's read from uh, each line in the input file. Uh, the correlation with the file happens here. We don't need to talk about details here, but this is how you specify that this uh, file predicate is assigned to this file and this separator is this and that. Uh, and this predicate has a special character in front of it. It has an underscore. And yesterday we talked about underscore in variables and we, told, uh, and we said that when you are using underscore in your variables, it means that you don't care about its value. Well, underscore in front of a predicate means that this predicate is temporary and after this transaction finishes, then this predicate will be gone. So this predicate will be there as long as the file import happens and after the file import it will be erased. But the thing to note here is that this file predicate is then used to add facts into a bunch of other predicates like plus assigned cast instruction, plus assigned cast type, plus assigned cast from, etc. What's the back tick? Uh, here, in assigned cast. Uh, yeah. So the back tick is the, the way that you refer to other predicates inside the predicate. Those are not really predicates, they are, you can call it directives of the engine, so they are really low level. But with the backtick, you, you refer to the name of an actual predicate and not just a string or a variable or something. Just how you quote the predicate name. Oh, all right. Actually. So Where is that file, sorry? It's here. Logic facts. Oh, logic you, you mean the file? Yeah, logic facts import. So the root of all predicates would be either I mean, if you're looking for the schema for the database, you will look either in declarations, fact, yeah. declarations.logic, or in flow insensitive declarations. If you see something that has a slightly different form from what you see on the disk in terms of facts, uh, you will see the transformation in import logic. And it's the way George described it. So import is just a transitive step from the files into your database. And then we have two files for the file schema. You, uh, we talk about declarations and 
deploy in sensitive declarations. And that's it because uh, when you import uh, fi uh, data from the files, you have also information about the place that it's uh, uh, instruction happens in the file. So the input facts are flow sensitive. But for example, an analysis might be flow insensitive. So there is a transformation step that projects, projects out the, the information about the instruction number. So you have both versions of, of the facts, the flow sensitive and the flow insensitive. And then your analysis can use whatever it needs. I guess a higher level point is you don't need to remember any of that. I don't know much of that. Most of it, whenever I need to, uh, I need to know it, I just look it up. I just look up the code. It's not that huge. I mean, you can just grab for the right thing there. And if you see some relation that doesn't have the form you expect, you just look where it was declared. And if you look for something, some concept, and you try to see how it's used, you just look for similar usages in the code. And there will always be good examples inside the code. So part of what we're going to do today and tomorrow is go through the code and try to familiarize you with that. Uh, so I mean, f uh, first we'll do the getting acquainted with uh, the deep relations that George is going to show us now. And then, in order to get the most out of this, what I'd like to do today is do a data log tutorial. So actually have you write some small data log programs independently of Doop, just to be sure that you are OK with writing interesting data log programs. And once you feel very familiar with that, then we can go back to the Doop code and see more advanced concepts. So yesterday, we left where we had run uh, successfully an analysis, the naive analysis, and we had the database ready. And OK, you have the database with your results. The first thing that you might be interested to do is just print the tables. We saw an example yesterday with a minus print flag. I can do it again, just to fresh that up. Okay, we see here that the field points to relation has only one entry. That's one way to, to query the database. But that's limiting, because that's just printing the results of the whole table. So the next step, that the next way that you can query the database is actually writing queries of your own. So if you go again in the tutorial, I have an example here, the first query that we are going to try. So you issue queries with a minus query flag, and then you provide a string with your query. And the string that you provide, the query that you write, is actually pretty much anything that you could write in data log programs. So anything that you could write in your rules, in your, in your files that you used up, to, up until now, you could write in a, in a query. So here my query is the following. I have a, a rule, you see here a, a left arrow. The body says that if you have some var points to information for a var variable and that points to a heap, heap, and this variable is declared inside this specific method, okay, then I want to keep this information into a new predicate called, I don't care about the name, I'll just use the underscore here because it's a temporary predicate that will only be alive for as long as this transaction, this query happens. I just want to get the results back. I don't want to store the query anywhere. I don't want, I don't want to keep the information some, in some place in my database. I just want to basically join <coughs> the whole var point to relation with and filter it where the variable is declared inside the specific method. So here I'm keeping the var points to information for the variables of the specific uh, method. Okay, and this is a this string here is the weird way that do, uh, should and we represent facts. So if you are not sure how you should write a string that represents a specific method, you can just grab for the method that you're looking in the input facts, and you would see how the exact string should be. So I run this query, 
I get all these results, and those results are printed on my, my screen. By the way, I hope you're all following this also from the Dupe 101 tutorial, because that's, I mean, you can see more text on your screen than uh, what George can project there. Okay, how about, how about till now? So you, you run your rules, you import your facts, and then you either print the whole tables or uh, do specific queries. And this quiz can be as complex as you can imagine. I may ask something? Yes. The, the logic files, you created them at some point in the past? Yes. Okay. This is uh, the source code. Oh, by the way, something that we missed yesterday, and someone mentioned it. Here you see that the name of this predicate is var column clearing method. You can ignore the column. It's, it doesn't have any special semantics. It's just part of the name. Okay, we just use it to group uh, predicates together. But it's just another character in the name. Okay, that was a simple query. And again, I told you that queries can be as complicated as you can imagine them. Here I have a second query inside a file called query, the, uh, query 2 that's located under the docs slash do 101 examples directory in your repo. And here I have two rules for a predicate called underscore path. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm uh, inferring paths in the graph, a uh, call graph uh, relation. So I have the trivial case where you have a, an edge in the call graph and that is invocation happens inside the method from method. So I have a path from method to to method. That's the trivial case. And then I have a path from method to to method and there is an invocation in the second method to another mm -hmm. one. So I, I generate another path. Okay. It's simple trust the closure over the call graph relation. So here I just want to find which method can uh, which method can call another method transitively, not just directly. And the way that I query this thing is similar to the one I had before, minus query, but now I use the minus file plug and I specify the file with my query. And again, I see here a bunch of results. <coughs> Test inside example will call set parent of cut. Main will call set parent of cut. Test will call get parent of cut, etc., etc. It all makes sense if you look at the source code. Okay. I guess I should skip the the couple part. Yeah. Uh, should we look at aggregations? I have this fear that people are a little lost. Yeah. That. Uh, so yeah, maybe we should try. Oh, ma maybe I should just mention bytecode to Jimple to have a feel about Jimple. Yeah. Th well, we can just mention it. So uh, I mentioned earlier that. Shoot takes bytecode, Java bytecode, and translates that to, to Jimple, which is uh, similar to three others code. And we take, take Jimple and generate the input facts. But if you want to inspect Jimple yourself, we have a simple tool called bytecode Jimple. There is a directory in the top level. And you just, there, if you invoke it without arguments, you will get a, a help. But the invocation is, is similar to that. Byte go to Jimple, run. Sorry. Uh, you specify a directory, the Jimple D, where I want my results to, to be stored. And you specify a jar file that you want to uh, uh, generate Jimple from. So it's docs, loop, one on one, examples, example jar. Uh, OK, sorry. Should be inside. That 
that's actually part of the build process uh, in Duke? It's not of the main build process. It's a different sub-project, a small sub-project inside the repo, so you can invoke it isolated if you, want, if you need. Uh, okay, and the path is incorrect. Sorry. Okay, if you look here, there is a simple dash d directory. That's the, the directory that I provided in the minus d flag. And if you go inside, you will see I have four files. So for each class file that would be generated when you could uh, when you would compile the, the source code, you get a jimpl file, which has the translation from bytecode to jimpl. So if you want to look at an example, jimpl looks like this. <coughs> So everything is three hours. And that's uh, helpful when you debug, you're debugging your analysis or some small thing that you're trying. And you have a small test Java file. You compile it, you create the jar, and you import that in the analysis. You might need uh, some time to look at the jimple that's generated and do the mapping inside the, your head. Yes. So you take a jar, yes. it's in bytecode, yes. you translate it into Jimbo internally, yes. right? Uh, well, through should. Ah, through should does the translation. Okay. Uh, so why it should does a translation and this tool also so does a translation? No, this is invoking should. Okay. So should takes bytecode and splits out Jimbo. Mm -hmm. We have a front end that takes this jimple and generates your input facts, and we have another small front end that takes this jimple and generates the file. Okay. And it, it's just querying the results from suit and printing them in a file. And why do you use jimple? I mean, because three op three operands are a good uh, way to. Well, uh, otherwise the you had to uh, to formalize the stack-based bytecode which is t totally different from what you ha would have in mind when you write the, the source code. Ah, okay. Ah, so it, it's a way Where Jimpl is really similar to the source code that you had, but ah. it's simplified. So if you had, uh, it will create uh, intermediate uh, variables to store results, etc. but similar to the flow that you have in your original source code. So, so the, the things that you don't want to care about the stack-based... Uh, yeah, they are structured that way, yeah. by should. We don't see anything from the bytecode here. Okay. And it's easier to, to formalize than the analysis. Because here, for example, you have an assignment. Where is an assignment? You have an assignment from uh, this parameter to this variable, and you can say, OK, this is my input. I have an assignment from this variable to the other variable. Otherwise, if you would play with byte, but you have to formalize stack yourself. So you want two pointer analysis. For pointer analysis, you want the language, like a small imperative language with allocations and assignment. So you have to translate your jar into such a language with allocations and assignment. And well, I guess you can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, I think that people will start exploring the code at a certain point and uh, we'll come back to this. Yes. But for now, I think that uh, we, we can do something higher level, like maybe get them some training in data log, mm -hmm. like do some exercises and make sure that everyone can write some data log, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you have some exercise ready? I do. So. Will there be exams at the end of the seminar? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Could you show the command that you use to generate the Yes, it's also in the tutorial. <coughs> it's uh, this one. 
You are inside the bytes of the Jimple directory. And also, if you just invoke run without argument or with, I think it's minus help, you will get an explanation of the flags. So. Okay, so um, okay, so we got the basics of data log evaluation, right? I mean, this is a slide I'm going to show again. Uh, on, at some later point, probably not today. But we have rules of this kind, and every time we match the bodies, and all the bodies match are satisfied, we infer the relation that's in the head of the rule. And we do that monotonically. We keep adding tuples based on these rules firing, and this is implemented, as we said, by joining the database tables. There is one thing that we didn't mention too much, which is how negation is handled. To make sure that this is all monotonically done, every time we have a predicate and we use negation, which you haven't seen in any of the examples, negation has to be stratified, meaning that you can use negation over simpler relations, simpler predicates, to build more complex ones, but you can never have a recursive cycle through negation. You can never have a predicate that recursively depends upon itself in a negated way. You will, you will encounter all that, so we will have examples of that. I'm just warning you that this is a major thing that we, that we will see pretty soon if we ever need to use negation. Now, where will you need to use negation? We'll get to that. So what I'd like us to do is imagine a simple domain not full dupe by any means, just a simple domain of graph uh, operations or maybe instructions in an intermediate language. And what we want to do here is define certain relations. And I want all of us to work together, or I want everyone individually to try to define the first four relations or so, and then we can use the last two uh, to think a little deeper. So before we go any further, I'd like everyone to be clear on how to define all of them. So what I'd like you to do is, assuming a relation next, next ij, and you can think of it as next in an instruction setting, I want you to implement reachable ij, which is kind of trivial, and then other concepts such as reachable bypassing ijk, meaning j is reachable from i but not through k so k cannot appear <coughs> anywhere in the pass in the path from i to j also reachable from an entry node assuming that i've given you an entry node or multiple entry nodes uh, in this graph and can reach return assuming that i've given you return instructions so let's start with these four one by one uh, this is something that you will work on as a text file and after you're done, after we think we're done with the four, I'll give you example data to try those on and to see what uh, your definitions do. But we will also work with you to make sure that uh, you come up with reasonable definitions for those. And then we will do the last two which are a little trickier and there we will need to use negation. But for now the first four should be good, gradual, uh, gradually harder exercises. I think you should explain again the second one. Okay, so I'll go write some definitions. J is reachable from I without going through K. This means, of course, that I is different from K, J is different from K, but also no part of the path. Be there's a path between I and J, and no node on that path is K. There could be a different path that goes through K, but there, there exists some path from I to J that doesn't go through K at all. 
is the meaning of the second one. And then readable from entry is if I've given you an entry, you just combine that with readable so it's easy. Uh, and can reads return similarly, you may want to define that. So maybe you should have like at least without going through K. I'm it's sorry? not like there is no path through K. It's that there is at least one path <coughs> that's without K. Okay, so because otherwise you would be negation. Well, J is readable from I without going through K. Okay. So readable means able to read. There is a path from I to J that doesn't go through K. Okay. Well, this is this is like, but all four of those should be fairly straightforward. Uh, so try to write the definitions, and uh, we can. Uh, I can give you facts, check them on, and then we can discuss the last two. Yeah. Uh, do we need to know something more like built-in operators for comparison for not equals to? Well, they are your common operators. So okay. equals equals okay. and. Uh, well, not equals, just not equals uh, equals, just equals. equals. And the other are the same. Well, not equals, bang equals. Yeah, bang greater bang. than, etc. But we, we we will see your definitions. So. Try to write those, use the Duke 101 files, like the Answer. same structure as the um, ancestor.logic and ancestor facts files. Well, not the facts, because... Not the facts. I'll give you facts. I'll Just give you rules. decals and facts. Just try to write these four definitions, and we will work with them until we make them actually executable. What is entered there? There's going to be an entry instruction or multiple entry instructions that I'm going to give you. And I just want readable from entry, which is an implicit. An implicit readable thing. Implicit readable. Like i is readable from i. When you're. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, are we all done with, uh, with the exercises? Is there anyone who's still working on the second part? Yes, but, uh, <laughs> right. But is there anyone from the people who are here this morning who's still working on the second part? Nobody? Okay. So you saw that it's very easy to express these concepts that are existentially quantified, the readable from entry, meaning there exists some entry point and i and i are different here, so j, let's say, just to be clear. There exists some entry point j that can read our instruction i. There exists some return instruction j that our instruction i can read. Those are very easy to express. These were a bit trickier. And to express those, we needed to do a for all emulation using existentials. And probably your solution looked a bit like this in data log. So let's focus on one part. So you probably wrote something like this for the last two concepts. For cannot reach all returns, I expect you had something like this. And for predecessor not reachable from entry, you probably had something like that, right? I mean, how did you express 
cannot reach all returns, uh, can reach all returns. You first expressed cannot reach all returns, meaning there's some return instruction J that's not reachable from I, and then you negated that. So here we used reachable that we defined earlier. Inside the data log engine, the reason that we were able to use negation is that this negation is stratified. So it's just syntactic sugar that something, uh, for something that we could do without negation. So if we look at the whole flow uh, it, through our rules, our rules go like this. We have concepts like next, and these depend on instruction. And next is, next is used to define readable. And readable is recursive, so it depends on itself because it has a transitive closure in its definition. And then readable is used to define cannot reach all returns. So we have instruction, and we also have other inputs like return instruction. And this is used to define cannot reach all returns. And cannot reach all returns is used to define can reach all returns. And we have negation here at two parts. We have negation at this point, where we say not readable, and we have negation at this point. <coughs> is that right? OK. So this is what we mean by stratified negation. There's some stratification of our program so that anything that's negated can be fully computed before we need to compute the rest. So our entire program can be evaluated so that readable has reached a fixed point. The contents of readable have fully been determined before we need to negate them and compute cannot read all returns. And that one can reach a fixed point before we negate it and compute the rest. So there's a natural order. These parts get computed first, up until reachable. And then this part gets computed. And then this part, get, this part gets computed. This is what makes this monotonic. This computation is monotonic, even though it uses negation because its execution is stratified. There's this natural ordering, and this reaches a fixed point before that, before that. If I had negation somewhere here, if readable depended on itself based on negation, what could go wrong? What would be the problem? Lose monotonicity. We lose monotonicity, but how exactly? Like, what would be an example? It could be that I have inferred something to be readable, transitively, and then I have a rule that says readable is true only if some other part of readable is not true. And then by inferring more readable facts, I remove the reason why I inferred the previous ones. So we can talk about all sorts of paradoxes, about the liar's paradox, all cretans are liars, etc. But specifically, the problem here is the contents of this cannot fully settle because they may be computed through some negated rule. And then computing more may remove the base for establishing previous contents. So if we want to, to have our execution be monotonic, if we want to have a guarantee that everything will just keep adding 
more tuples to the ones we had computed before, we need this guarantee of stratification. Yes? Is this a rule of thumb? I mean, uh, to define new HM to depend on a negation of itself, it's not very, uh, how to call it, intuitive in data log or prologue. Uh, That's correct. thinking, I think so. Perhaps uh, if, if there is a notion or a, a concept that may ha have this attribute, perhaps it should be split into two. I mean, in order to avoid uh, dependency on negation on itself. Yeah, but it's not, it's not always possible to do that. There will be many useful concepts that we'll need to define where we will have negation that depends on itself in an indirect way, not directly. Yes. Nothing will directly, it's, it's rarely the case that something will depend on itself directly uh, and will have negation and recursion, though that can also happen. Uh, but it's definitely the case that we can have complex recursion through multiple other concepts and then suddenly we'll need to go back somewhere. Yeah. Here our reachable was very easy because reachable here depended only on input relations. What if we have a reachable that's computed as part of a points to analysis? Reachable inside the call graph of a complicated program. And to compute what's reachable, we'll need to compute what uh, every variable points to. And if anywhere in this we have negation, we will have a cycle. So we will see examples of cycles. But the whole point is the simple cases always have stratified negation. This kind of a negation, we could completely remove it. One can think of it as creating explicitly by, by hand the concept of not reachable and populating by exhaustive iteration over all the instructions. So this is just a syntactic shorthand. This, the contents of reachable settle, and after that, we can settle the contents of cannot reach all returns. And after these have settled, we can settle the contents of can reach all returns. So that's what we meant by stratification. Is that somewhat clear? OK. So that's what we used here for the answer to this, and similarly for the answer to that. The answer for predecessors not readable, uh, all predecessors readable from entry. So any solution you had probably used negation at two different places, but it doesn't matter because it's stratified negation. The item that gets negated has already been fully computed before we negate it and go, to com go on to compute the next stage. So everything proceeds in stages. That's the element here. Okay. Okay. So there will actually be a more complex emulation of a for all. So what we said here is that in order to do all predecessor visible from entry or can reach all returns, all these properties they use the concept of a for all in logic. There are going to be more complex emulations of a for all that we're going to see in the next couple of days, where we will have some recursion, but we'll still be able to compute everything in data log. But I'll leave that for a little later. Uh, but the point is, first of all, you should see that we have a problem with recursion and negation. And we sidestep this problem in this particular instance because it's easy to just compute everything beforehand. Okay. So are there any more questions about these exercises, the concepts that we saw this morning? Okay. In that case, I think George can come and uh, give us uh, some instructions on using scripting with the engine based on the, the same input uh, facts that we saw earlier. And then I can go on with a bit more theory and talk about pointer analysis and context sensitivity in pointer analysis. So, uh, except for blocks bus, there's uh, another thing that you should have right now in your path, which is called the blocks compiler. So just type uh, blocks compiler for now. Or minus H for help or something like that. Or lowercase. Okay. 
Okay, so it was little, a bit, little of a pain uh, before writing all these uh, mistakes to our logic. So we, we do have a compiler that can uh, catch some errors, uh, which is quite handy. Um, so in order to use the compiler, okay, oh, I'm not writing anything right now. So in order to use the compiler, we first have to uh, create um, a project file. So uh, in the same directory that you have your files, you should uh, create, a, let's say, a graphs.logic file. And you should add this file. Dot project. What? Dot logic. Or dot, uh, dot project. If you have the files ready, maybe you can just show us yours. Um, it's uh, we can uh, write them right now. Do you remember where you have uh, your files here in the directory? There should be a, some open uh, terminal. Okay, there. Just use that. Now you exited. It's right here. Where the, the files? Well, but you exited, so. You, you were on Emacs. No. You remember? Say dupe. Okay. So first thing we should do is uh, create a project file. And roughly what we have to do to put in here is a, a list of all our files uh, of our logic. So just pick everything that, uh, that we have. So we pipe the less into the project file? Yeah, but then we have to change it a little. Okay. So mainly graph that logic. Okay, now, uh, and also we have to put a first line to, to name our project. So you should have a line on the start like this. So this is just a CSV file. Uh, the first line should include a project name directive, which states which is the name of the project. Are so just. The font of it? How do you do that here? Shift click. Okay. One more. And then we have to add the second column to each file. Okay, so for declarations or for plain logic, it should have the active, uh, the active value, whereas for uh, for EDB logic, which is like the file predicates that Jan is used, uh, we should have inactive. So let's take a look here at the, the facts. So pretty much files, logic files that have these plus signs here, which create new, uh, which are, use a extension on logic, EDB logic, should all be uh, 
marked as uh, inactive files. This is not the file we want, though. For facts. That's not no, the that's file that I shared with everyone. Oh, just kill sure. this one. Okay. Okay, so if you have created this file, you should run uh, the command blocks compiler and then uh, compile project, camel case, and then just the path to the dot project file. And just, it should uh, compile your project. So you should have everything now. If anybody, it works for anybody. Can you say the commands again? It should be logs compiler, compile project. No, no dash. And uh, okay. So as you can see here, there's a bunch of LBB files created which are the compiled versions of uh, all our logic files. Um, so alternatively, we can uh, add uh, an out dir option, something like that, to put all these, uh, the compiled files into another directory, like uh, the build file here, and just erase everything from our main directory. So is it working, the blocks compiler command? Okay, we should probably change our logic to add some error. Let's see what happens. Okay, for instance, let's go here and uh, let's, let's erase this uh, instruction predicate that caused all our problems in the, in the previous exercises. And let's run the command again. Okay. Okay, so here's a kind of uh, error that you can get from the blocks compiler, which says that argument two of predicate reachable by passing must be given a type. Which is kind of the thing we wanted. Okay. I'll go with the uh, project uh, files. Okay, so Can you increase the font a little bit? Sure.
Can I see craft of project? Okay. Okay, craft of project. Is this okay? And present more? So. Have you written it like that? Yeah. Have you put any strange characters? That's no, that's it's as simple as that. Just uh, a project name and a list of uh, the logic files with Does either active or inactive. Uh, Does the order make any difference? Yes. So here the order makes a difference. Uh, that's the reason that why declarations have to go first, uh, then the facts, and uh, then the, the logic. If we could try the other way around, it would uh, complain about not having uh, any declarations for uh, things uh, used in those files. So just put the declarations first always, and uh, then the logic. Okay. Uh, so now we have compiled our project, but what can we do with it? Doesn't make much sense. We cannot use it. So let's just create uh, the database again and I'll give it another name. Let's GraphDB, for instance. So it's an, an empty database, and now we can use blocks badge to install the project. Okay, so to install some project uh, into some database, we do it with blocks badge again. So it's the same command here. Now I have to increase the font here also. Control plus. Okay, can you change see that? Change the prompt. Change the Okay, so here's the command we need. It should be minus install. Minus install. <coughs> I got an error anyway. Okay, so the minus install or not depends basically on the LB version. It changes at versions 3.9 or 3.10 but each other of those things so this has done this has also added the uh, declarations logic that we had and the rules logic uh, and it has compiled and checked that uh, the facts logic is correct but that it hasn't uh, executed it yet so to execute it we have to do it separately uh, have we done anything else before this command I'm getting error running install project directory build required directory module not found in build. Okay. Let me see that. Build was the output created from compiler. Created a database before. Yeah, I have it in. Getting the same error. But where, yeah, same what did you put in build? All the LBB files? Well, it, it's the argument in the compiler. What's the name of the Minus out the graph DB. Το πρώτο, το να ξανακάνει εκείνη τη βάση, το 280. Είναι αυτό που 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 είναι
Are the commands here? No. It's working for me. <laughs> so I'm posting a few commands in Slack. No, uh, have you uh, have you compiled the project? Logs compiler. So. Uh, with blocks compiler, the blocks compiler command. This one. Yes. Mm. Yeah, without deer, so it's here. Ah, yeah, you the deer there. Yes. So again. You should all run the, the blocks compiler command with the out deer option. So George has posted this on Slack. What? The command is on Slack. Okay. George Castrin has just posted it. So to build and check that there is a the build directory with the LBB files inside. Okay, yeah, yes. that's what it Okay. And then the blocks batch install project command should work. Uh, I have some warnings about uh, when defining series function or simple ESDA. Yeah, you should have the same. Uh, we usually get the version of the other. Yeah. It's the latest one. I have to say, I have to say, I have to say, I Just do the steps again. So we have uh, an empty workspace. It's not going to compute anything, right? The facts are no. not really added. We have to execute those. So the install project, what does it do? It just adds a compiled project yeah. into your uh, workspace. Yeah. Well, my question is you can run again the same command. You can run again install project. It will uh, not complain, but. If you add a single block twice, then it does complain. So what's the difference? Why, if I say blocks batch add block, yes. and then I say again, blocks batch add block, and it's the same, blocks batch will complain. It will say, no, it's the same block. I already have it. I cannot replace it. But here, you seem to be able to install the same project twice. So yeah, that, that should not happen, actually. Maybe it's because I have an error. And it doesn't do anything right now, so let's change it, compile the project again. No, even without an error. Why don't you remove the build directory? Because it's already compiled. Yes, yes. Why don't you remove the build directory? Yeah, but you can add, if you say add block. Right, then it tries to re add it. It gives that error. The compile phase, probably, yeah. it checks that it's already compiled, yeah. it does not, it's the second time, oh, no. but I get yeah. it, that's the case. Okay. Okay. So the account should be empty. Okay. Sorry for interruption. Okay. Why is there... It was reachable, the command name, right? Yes. But you haven't executed, you haven't executed any deltas. Yeah, yeah but should I, I just did a print in for it should exist on the schema, but... It exists on the schema. Um, okay, so just to, to execute... Uh, the facts uh, logic to actually produce something we have to do it in a separate step. Just give me a moment. Since I'm on a different PC. Uh, graph. Right.
sorry for that. I had everything prepared on my other laptop, so I have to find it again here. So I mean, not from you, since you are preparing the thing. So okay. from you, maybe. <laughs> I think we're just seeing the compiler functionality, which can be used to type check your files Instead separately just without installing them one by one. So you can compile lots of files together and add them. 